Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I know I said this last week, I'm really excited to wrap up and it's not because I've been missing Lions football on Sundays. That might be part of it, but that's not the main reason I'm excited to wrap up. Um, I'm excited to wrap up because this has been a really fun course and I've enjoyed running it for all of you. Um, and I really like the material that we're going to be covering this week. And, and I've kind of been looking forward to getting to the last class session. So last time we talked about the Reformation, uh, particularly focusing on the English Reformation and uh, the dissolution of monastic houses under Henry VIII in the 1530s up to 1540. Um, and for the most part, right, at least within, um, you know, within, um, you know, the Anglican Church and within, you know, the British Isles, um, there were not monastic houses from that point in time up through the, um, around the 1850s, about 300 years. Now, that being said, you might be wondering, well, why are we starting in 1625? And we'll get there in just a little bit, uh, and we're going to talk about a certain Nicholas Farrar, who you may be familiar with the Society of St. Nicholas Farrar, but we'll get to that also later. In any case, so today we're mostly going to be talking about um, the Oxford movement, um, sort of this, you know, uh, revival of Anglo-Catholic um, theology and thought within Anglicanism in the 1800s, and then jump a little bit ahead to uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and new monasticism before concluding with the state of monasticism in uh, the Anglican communion today. So again, as we have the whole time that we've been doing this course, we're going to start with a, a sort of thematic for this week. And I, I will admit that I think that even though this is one that's really important to talk about, it's the one I think that's maybe the most shoehorned in here. Um, but it's still something I think that it it's, you know, you can't really talk about monasticism without talking about vows. And we've talked about them a little bit to this point, um, you know, but what, I guess, based on what we've learned so far, what would you all think that vowing oneself to something means? Well, the C word, commitment. Right, right, absolutely. It's, it's definitely a commitment or you know, as I put it here, it's it's to make promises, right? But then that sort of begs the question of to whom or to what are we promising these things, right? Um, and, you know, I, I think the obvious answer is principally it's to God, but it's also to the others, you know, uh, to those in, in the monastic communities that, you know, monastics might belong to um, or to our various communities, you know, within the church. Um, you know, I think the way that I would put it is that vows are, as um, a lot of these aspects of monasticism we've talked about, they're very much so based in relationships, right? So I think I asked a similar question when we were talking about rule of life. Um, who takes vows, right? when you, and we're, we're talking in a, the, a broad sense here, you know, not just monastics, right? Everybody who gets married sure. <laughs> takes a vow, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the, the point here is, is that vowing oneself to something isn't just something that exists within the context of, of monasticism. And yes, in a literal sense, right? Somebody professing themselves to full membership in a monastic community, you usually take your vows when you become a professed full member of a community. But we each promise things to God as Christians in our baptismal covenant, or if we're baptized as infants, those things are you know promised on our behalf by those sponsoring us, right? Um, clergy vow themselves to certain things when they take their ordination vows, right? You know, that's part of the ordination, right? So, you know, those are sort of examples of how vows exist outside of the context of monasticism. But 
sort of taking that and focusing it back inward on the subject we're talking about today, what then would you say that a vow is within the context of monastic life? And yes, we're familiar with, you know, the simplicity, fidelity, obedience from Island Power Fellowship, um, or the traditional three poverty, chastity, and obedience. But what exactly do those mean for a monastic? None of us are monastics except Lizzie. <laughs> That's fair. Um, so I don't. I mean, I can't say what they mean for a monastic. I would assume that it it's a, a a deeper commitment to the the way of discipleship within the context of that particular community. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's. I think that that's probably how I would also characterize it, right? You know, um, when you vow yourself to something, right, you are making a promise to both the community and to God to live in accordance, you know, with, at least in the context of a monastic community, you're making a promise to live in accordance with the discipline of that community, um, within the, you know, um, you know, the apostolate of that community. Uh, we've talked about those terms before, right? Um, and, you know, it's within the context of, you know, the Benedictines have, um, you know, come into being and received a certain sort of way of, of being monastics that's been passed down from generation to generation, the Augustinians, the Franciscans, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, whether you're taking those traditional three vows or other vows, they're, you know, they're rooted in the character of that community that you belong to and are vowing yourselves to, right, in, in taking those vows. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it is, um, what am I trying to say exactly? Um, there's the historical precedent to it, right? You know, and me as the historian, that's that's the thing that I always like to think of is sort of where are these vows in context, right, uh, of the people who have taken them before us. So let's skip now into the history, right, and we'll, we'll get back to vows as we always do at the end. So I had mentioned at the beginning, right, why are we starting in the time period that we're starting in? Well, um, even though monastic communities, uh, monastic houses in sort of the traditional sense had um, been dissolved within the Anglican church under Henry and then after um, Mary I brought Catholicism back and then after Elizabeth took the throne after her, Elizabeth sort of sealed the deal on that being the thing, right? But there were people who were interested in bringing monasticism back from fairly early on um, after that had occurred, right? And we had said last time that it was 1540, that was the, the final date for um, you know, the, the second round of dissolutions under Henry VIII. Um, and if you look at Nicholas Farrar here, right? And you look at the time period in which he lived, he, he lived in his early life through that happening. Right. Um, now, who is Nicholas Farrar? Well, he's an English scholar, courtier, businessman. Um, he actually lost most of his family fortune investing in the London Virginia Company, which is the Sir Walter Raleigh one. And after he had, you know, lost most of his family fortune, he and I believe I think I say it in here his. Uh, mother, um, his brother and his uh, brother's family, and uh, they all purchased an estate in uh, Huntingtonshire, which uh, went by the name of Little Gidding. And it was sort of this, you know, um, you know, rural country estate with a little chapel attached to it, right? And the Farrar family lived there and practiced that. I suppose what 
I would say is sort of a quasi religious life. Um, they didn't take vows. There wasn't a constitution or a rule in the strict sense that we've talked about it before, but um, they did very much so devote themselves to praying the daily office on a regular basis, right? And I know we've kind of talked about this before, and I think this is probably as good a time as any to just briefly cover, you know, what the history of, of the Book of Common Prayer is and the, the daily office in it. Um, the first Book of Common Prayer was published in 1549. Um, and it contained um, the four offices that we, you know, would recognize from our Book of Common Prayer, right? Morning prayer, evening prayer. Um, it had um, the litany, it had um, service for Holy Communion, various other occasional services, so baptism, confirmation, marriage, et cetera, et cetera. It was sort of republished with various additions um, another two times. Um, and the uh, 1604 edition of it uh, under King James I um, added the, uh, the catechism. Uh, to the BCP, which, you know, it's sort of interesting to think about that, that that wasn't sort of in there from the beginning. But, um, you know, I, I guess sort of the two points I wanted to get at here, uh, one is that we've talked about the divine office before. And in essence, the, the daily office as it is in the Book of Common Prayer is sort of a splicing together of the various offices of those um, you know, the, the nine traditional offices, right, that were said in monastic communities. And so it's interesting kind of in this period of, of you know, the Church uh, of England sort of pulling away from monasticism at the same time saying, well, there's value in this, right, and this ancient practice of, of praying at these certain times of the day in these certain ways. And so took those prayers and kind of combined them together into something that was um, more easily digestible um, for everyday people, right? Sort of the idea of the Book of Common Prayer in general is it's common prayer, right? It's in the vernacular, it's accessible to people who, you know, are able to, I mean, I suppose, purchase a book and read, which in and of itself is a high bar still in this period of time. But nonetheless, it became more accessible than simply something written in Latin for the clergy. Um, the other thing too is that the Book of Common Prayer is being published at a period of time where devotionals are really popular, right? So um, think, you know, Thomas Akempis's uh, Imitation of Christ, right, which comes from a couple hundred years earlier. But the idea being that people wanted these materials to be able to worship and, you know, have, you know, sort of a, a basis for their prayers in their own homes. Um, and families like the Ferrars really took that upon themselves and in the context of their sort of little, you know, not really religious community at Little Gidding, really devoted themselves to praying uh, the daily office and, and using that resource for themselves and for their own, you know, sanctification, right? Um, as I mentioned, I think in the first slide, there is a modern day uh, Society of St. Nicholas Ferrar which is a group of people who are similar to the Farrar family, right? They are a group of Episcopalians devoted to praying the daily office every single day. Um, so I already mentioned that, but yes, they, you know, sort of did follow a rule to a certain extent in, in the sense of using the Book of Common Prayer as a guideline for their worship. But, Nicholas Farrar, right, um, didn't start a new monastic community, right? He didn't found, a, you know, a monastery, right? Little Gidding was like a monastery in some respects, but it wasn't actually a monastery. And there, you know, weren't really a whole lot of attempts to do anything along those lines for another um, couple of centuries, and that's when we will now take another sort of time jump here 
and jump forward to the 1800s and talk about John Henry Newman, um, who was an English theologian, poet, and Anglican priest, later Roman Catholic priest and cardinal, although interestingly, uh, not a bishop, he was a uh, just a cardinal, which is an interesting thing to wrap your head around, but it's not a progression thing in the Catholic church. Anyway, point is, um, Newman was a very controversial figure and still is a very controversial figure for a lot of folks. Um, the fact that he, you know, is associated with Anglo-Catholicism uh, within the Anglican tradition, but then the fact that he also left the Anglican church and became a Catholic priest, right, is something that a lot of people sort of, you know, there's some sort of cognitive dissonance with that, right, you know. Um, and people have a lot of strong opinions about him on, on both sides, but simply sort of stating the facts and sort of who he was and, and what he was involved with. He's most associated with uh, something we call the Oxford Movement, which in very brief, again, this is another topic like the Reformation that we could do a whole class on, but in essence, the Oxford Movement was, um, you know, it was so called because it was a number of professors at Oxford who were interested in returning the Church of England to more Catholic roots and sort of bring back traditions from, um, you know, the medieval church into modern worship. Um, interestingly enough, Newman actually was an evangelical Christian in his youth. Um, he had a sort of conversion moment when he was, I think, 15 um, and was was very much so sort of of the evangelical bent of Anglicanism up until about the time that he was ordained. Um, you know, he writes about this, right, and sort of in his later life reflecting back notes that he credits that as being, you know, the thing that saved his soul. But, right, he had split from evangelicalism uh, by the time that he was ordained a deacon um, in 1824. So, as I mentioned, right, uh, Newman is associated as being one of the founders of the Oxford movement. There are uh, a lot of scholars who sort of debate how influential he actually was to the movement as a whole, um, and particularly in terms of his um, sort of leaving the Anglican Church and becoming a Catholic priest, how big of an impact that had on the Oxford movement. Um, so again, associated with student with Oxford University. Um, now, one of the reasons that Newman kind of gets brought up in this, there, there are really two reasons. The first being, as we'll see in just a little bit, the Oxford movement was really the, um, you know, it was one of the turning points of people calling for a revival of monasticism in the Anglican church. Um, but the second, being that Newman himself actually with a number of, of sort of his followers after he had, um, he hadn't left, um, he hadn't become a Roman Catholic priest at this point, but he had resigned his teaching post at Oxford and had founded a, a quasi monastic community in Littlemore in Oxford. And uh, they, you know, him and his companions sort of lived a quasi monastic lifestyle. Again, similar to Farrar, they didn't take a vow, um, but they sort of devoted themselves to uh, daily prayer and study. And um, he actually produced a lot of written material um, at this time. So we've we've talked about it a little bit to this point, but you know what what exactly was the Oxford movement, and again, why is it important in in discussing all of this? Um. So. As I had mentioned, right, the Oxford movement was um, an Anglo-Catholic reform movement within the Anglican church um, that sought to return it to its Catholic roots and reintroduce some uh, particularly medieval practices uh, which had fallen out of favor in the wake of the Reformation. So incense, for instance, right? Just being sort of a off the top of my head example, that's, that's a fairly obvious one, right? 
Um, the movement was also known as the Tractarians, which was so named after um, a series of publications kind of combined into a larger work known as the Tracts for the Times, um, which consist of works compiled between 1833 and 1841. Um, some of those works are one or two pages, others are book length. So it's it's quite interesting just sort of how of those publications, 90 in total, um, they sort of vary in terms of, uh, they vary widely in terms of topic and also in terms of, of uh, their individual length. Um, and again, they're not just one author writing uh, these, you know, these pieces either, but um, about a dozen authors, uh, including uh, Newman, and uh, I always have trouble pronouncing his name, Edward Bouvet, Bouveret Bouzy, I think is how I've figured out how to say it, but that might be completely off. Um, in any case, um, so, one of the and again this is sort of where a lot of the controversy comes in here and we're not going to get into this in any great detail um but one of the things that the oxford movement um sort of purported and one of its its main kind of positions was what we know as branch theory and in essence it basically holds that anglicanism is one of a number and the the number varies depending on who you ask but one of a number of distinct branches of the one holy catholic and apostolic church um so usually you know sort of the i guess sort of the the most basic version would would count roman catholicism anglicanism and eastern orthodox um traditions as being the three main branches but you sometimes have scandinavian lutheran moravian coptic churches thrown in there as well um, so as I, I've kind of alluded to here, right, one of the aspects of the Oxford movement, and this is where we kind of get back on track with the monasticism part of this class, is that one of the aspects that they called for um, restoring to the church, right, one of those ancient practices was monasticism. Um, and that in part has to do with sort of, uh, on one hand, this recognition of a social need that monasticism filled, right? And particularly social services to the poor. Um, remember we talked briefly last time about um, sort of the transition from, um, you know, within the context of the dissolution of monastic houses, that a lot of the services they provided uh, were transferred from the monastic houses to local municipalities in the state. And that had in certain circumstances the effect of um you know basically blocking certain people from accessing those services right as you know the monastic houses those services would have been available to everyone and as something run by a municipality they were only potentially available to people who lived in that municipality um so that was one of the calls here from the oxford movement to um you know, restore monasticism for that purpose. Um, but the second aspect, right, is is recognizing sort of the, the spiritual need of living out uh, a Christian life in a particularly monastic way, right? Something that, um, you know, has value in and of itself for, you know, spiritual purposes as compared to just being, you know, a merely, um, you know, pragmatic thing. So out of the Oxford movement, and we see sort of the, uh, the first religious orders and communities, um, you know, after a just slightly over 300 year absence, start to come into existence in the Anglican church. So I, I've seen some sort of, um, I guess what you would call competing claims to the first communities that were founded right after this period in time. The earliest one that I could actually find was known as the Community of St. Mary the Virgin, 
which was founded in 1848 in Oxfordshire. Again, you know, thinking about the Oxford movement, right? A lot of these early communities were sort of in um, the vicinity of Oxford and as well as sort of just the South of England in general. Um, another one, which I think has laid claim to the uh, being the earliest community, but from what I can tell, the date of its founding was actually 1857. Uh, is the Community of the Holy Cross, which was founded in East London. Um, one interesting thing about this community in particular is, is that actually they, um, I, I don't believe the Community of St. Mary the Virgin exists today. I might be wrong about that, but I don't believe they do. But the Community of the Holy Cross actually still does. Um, and interestingly enough, they actually, in the 1970s, discerned as a community that they felt called to the rule of St. Benedict and have been following a Benedictine rule um, ever since. Um, another one, which the, the name you might be familiar with, um, the Society of St. John the Evangelist, also known as the Cowley Fathers, who were founded uh, in Cowley, Oxford, um, off of Cowley Road um, in Oxford in 1896, and they have the distinction of being the first male community in the Anglican Church. I, I suppose I should have noted to that point, the first two were all female communities. Um, the last one I wanted to mention is one that we all should be familiar with as Episcopalians, being the Neshota community or Neshota house, um, which, whether you call it a monastic community or not is a little bit, you know, it's sort of a semantic thing. Um, but it was one of the things that kind of consistently came up as I was sort of researching this course as something that, um, you know, was associated with the Oxford movement and associated with, um, you know, again, I wouldn't call it a monastic community, but sort of a quasi monastic lifestyle. But in essence, um, the um, first missionary bishop of the Episcopal Church, uh, Jackson Kemper, uh, traveled into what was then the Northwest Territory, um, now the state of Wisconsin, uh, in 1842 um, with the intent of, uh, you know, missionizing and evangelizing to the Native American population there. Um, but in the process also founded uh, originally what was intended to be a school to educate missionaries and would over time uh, become what we know today as the seminary in Neshota House. So those are, I guess, a few of the uh, communities that sort of came out of the, um, you know, sort of the Oxford movement, I guess, as you know, specifically, again, the first three specifically monastic communities, um, you know, or, or uh, I guess, groups of individuals who lived in a quasi monastic lifestyle, if you count Neshota in with that. We're going to take another bit of a time jump here. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, a little bit of a time jump, and a little bit of a place jump. We're jumping to Germany. Um, so why is Dietrich Bonhoeffer important? Well, let's talk about who he was first. So Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor, theologian, and an anti-Nazi dissident. Um, he lived, uh, as you can see, obviously during the period of, of Adolf Hitler's rise to power and the Nazi party's rise to power in Germany in the 30s. Um, and uh, as you may be able to guess by his date of death, unfortunately was executed by the Nazi regime um, in the closing years of the war. Um, but we remember Bonhoeffer today as, as um, a founding member of what was known as the Confessing Church, which in essence were a group of um, German Protestant pastors um, who were opposed to the state's sanctioned German evangelical church, right? There's, that's sort of another whole topic for another time, but in essence, the Nazi state um, 
sort of had a state sanctioned Protestant church. Excuse me. Um, and these individuals, including Bonhoeffer, were very much so opposed to that. Um, he writes that uh, his time spent studying in America was uh, highly influential on his, um, you know, on his worldview and his sort of later thoughts on various things, including what he terms as new monasticism. Um, he actually studied uh, or uh, had a postgraduate fellowship, uh, teaching fellowship at uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York. And sort of, uh, I guess, in his writing credits this time as, as being a shift uh, from what he terms as phraseology to reality. So sort of getting away from sort of high academic speak about theology into sort of the reality of, of what it means to real people, or as he terms sort of the church from below. Um, uh, as he writes, here one can truly speak and hear about sin and grace and the love of God. So one of the other things that, that Bonhoeffer is known for is actually having founded what was I guess termed as an underground seminary uh, in Finkenwald, which was a neighborhood in a, um, a city and actually in what's modern day Poland, um, which was founded with the intent of, of training confessing church pastors and done very much so sort of, uh, at first it was a little bit more out in the open and as sort of the war went on and, and the Nazi regime was opposing Bonhoeffer and, you know, the confessing church, it kind of moved underground and he eventually, um, they sort of had to flee from Finkenwald and, and he did what they termed a seminary on the run and would sort of go from place to place and continue teaching. Um, but Finkenwald is important, I think, as well, because in a similar sort of vein to what we've talked about before, it was a place where Bonhoeffer and his students um, lived in a quasi-monastic lifestyle, right? And so he lived in a way that was, um, you know, sort of consistent with, again, sort of the other people we've talked about in terms of Newman, Farrar, um, you know, living a life of contemplation and prayer, although not explicitly taking a vow or, or professing to be monastic. So you may have heard the term new monasticism, and I know I've mentioned it, I think, a few times already. Um, and it normally gets associated with Bonhoeffer, and there's a few reasons for that. But, you know, I, I kind of think of it and characterize it in a sense uh, as one of a number of the reform movements that we've talked about in this class, right? We've talked about uh, the Cistercians, the Cremaster Tensions, the Mendicant Orders, things like that. Um, and so there was a lot of individuals who sort of saw things that were going on in the world and wanted to, you know, respond to them in a different way than their, their peers had been. Um, similar to those other movements, though, it isn't really a unified movement or one that has explicit sort of tenets or particular adherence to it. Um, rather, you know, I, I would describe it more so as a call to live uh, in a way that is more reminiscent of, of our Christian monastic heritage in a time where monasticism in, you know, certain parts of the world um, were not, you know, was not really, um, you know, um, was not really something that a lot of people had exposure to or practice with or knew a whole lot about. Um, as part of that, right, the the movement sort of called for a life of contemplative prayer, living a communal life, a, a focus on hospitality, as well as, as, you know, direct ministry to the poor. So the reason new monasticism is associated with Bonhoeffer comes particularly from um, writings, uh, I'll, I'll, I put the quote uh, in just a couple of bullet points here, uh, from Bonhoeffer, but it is, I think, more accurately attributed to uh, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove's 1998 book, Living Faithfully in a Fragmented World. Um, Wilson Hartgrove founded a, you know, 
what we would term as new monastic community um, and was sort of drawing on on Bonhoeffer's writings as well as as sort of you know other voices calling for um, a revival of monasticism but the particular thing that he was drawing on was this quote from Bonhoeffer in which he says the restoration of the church will surely come only from a new type of monasticism, which has nothing in common with the old, but a complete lack of compromise in a life lived in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount in the discipleship of Christ. Um, a lot of what Bonhoeffer wrote about was, was what he termed as um, cheap grace. And, you know, you may have heard that term before, but in essence, Bonhoeffer's I mean, you have to think, right? And, and you know, I, I'd encourage all of you to think as historians here for a second, right? What was the time in which Bonhoeffer was writing? What were the political circumstances of his life that would make him say that certain people were, um, you know, certain people were living with cheap grace, right? Does anybody have any? It's, it's fairly obvious. <laughs> So particularly in the context of the German evangelical church, the push by the Nazi regime, you know, to put their people in charge of the Protestant churches in Germany, um, you know, that is obviously, you know, antithetical to anything Christian, just first of all, but for Bonhoeffer specifically, right, you know, his point is that, um, you know, in order to, uh, I, I suppose the way I would put it is that in order to, you know, avoid a tragedy like World War II, like the Holocaust ever happening again, right, the church needs individuals that are committed to true discipleship in Christ. And for him, again, that's, that's lived out through following the Sermon on the Mount, right? So let's jump ahead again a little bit. Um, and we'll talk just briefly here at the end about monasticism in the Anglican communion today. Um, the picture on the left is actually a, um, a monument uh, to the Cowley Fathers in Oxford um, at the, uh, the parish yard of, what is it? Saints Mary and John parish in Oxford on Cowley Road. So where are we at today in terms of monasticism, right? Um, particularly within the Anglican communion. So there's monasticism of all types, right? You know, we've talked about Dominicans, we've talked about Franciscans, Augustinians, various other types of monastic communities. And in the, um, you know, um, you know, century and a half roughly since the Oxford movement, there have been an explosion of monastic communities who have drawn on all of these various ancient, um, you know, religious orders and, and religious traditions um, in sort of founding and establishing themselves, you know, within the Anglican communion and with a particularly Anglican character to them. So how many communities are there? Um, well, within the Episcopal Church, we officially recognize 18 traditional and 14 Christian communities. And, and if you recall from, was it the first class? I think it was the first class, but we discussed the distinction between those two things. The first being that they take the traditional vows and live in community. The second being that they live in accordance to a, a community rule or constitution, but don't have to take the traditional three vows. Um, so 32 in total, um, as well as a number of um, either organizations who are applying to uh, be officially recognized or ones who are sort of observer status. Um, I was going to put a bullet point in here about um, within the Anglican communion more broadly, but I had a very hard time actually tracking down an official number. Um, the best thing that I could come up with um, was a number from, I think it was 2002, 
that indicated that there were about 3,000 both male and female religious in the Anglican communion. Um, but I also know that there's a number of orders that have been founded since that time, right? Autumn Power Fellowship being one of them. So I would suspect that that number is a lot larger than that. Um, I would also say that a lot of these communities, um, you know, one of the things that we have to recognize, right, is that, I mean, the Episcopal Church particularly, but also, you know, the Anglican Communion is not, you know, it's, it's a global thing, right? Um, and Christianity is, is fast growing in various places of the world, particularly in Africa. Um, and a lot of religious orders are sprouting up, both Catholic and uh, Anglican uh, are sprouting up in Africa. And so that's just sort of uh, an interesting kind of, you know, thing to think about in terms of, I guess, the direction that the church is taking as we move in you know, in through the 21st century. Um, so within the Episcopal Church as well, there are actually two um, particular organizations, one associated with each the traditional and the Christian communities, those being NAC and Karoa. So NAC is the National Association of Episcopal Religious Communities. And Karoa is the Conference of Anglican Religious Orders in America. And they both uh, come together and have a, I don't actually know, Lizzie, if you're on here, I don't know if you can put it in the chat or not, but I don't remember how frequently they have their conference. Um, but they do have a regular conference at which religious orders and communities come together. And, you know, obviously as conferences do, right, have various workshops uh, talk about sort of their experiences, um, you know, discuss sort of what has worked, what hasn't worked for them, you know, what they find in terms of, you know, recruiting new members, what they found uh, in terms of sort of the formation that they run, um, you know, those sorts of things, um, and come together for, for that and for, you know, community worship and prayer. Um, so that's, that's the history that I have for you. Um, and it's kind of hard to believe thinking about this, right? That we're, we've, we've went through basically 2000 years of church history and here we are at the end. Um, so, you know, I guess sort of wrapping up here, I, I want to briefly return to vows and then do sort of a retrospective on, on the course, right? Um, so, We've talked about vows as being a promise made to live in accordance with a specific precept, or I suppose what you would call a set of precepts, right? Oop. So again, right, for a monastic specifically, it's rooted in that over 2000 years of history and practice that I just mentioned, right? You know, we've talked from Anthony of Egypt and Pacomius at the very beginning, all the way through you know, those that we talked about today, Farrar and, um, you know, and Newman and Bonhoeffer trying to live in a sort of quasi-monastic way, um, you know, in a more modern context, right? Um, and, you know, as we've seen, I think throughout the course that the way in which these vows and the way in which sort of the monastic life more broadly really has come into being is informed by discernment of, of you know, individuals and the communities that are involved, um, you know, relying on, you know, scriptural tradition and a lot of what we've seen in terms of, of um, you know, where certain monastic practices come from are rooted in scripture, um, as well as faithfully listening to God, which, you know, I suppose you could lump in with discernment, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, following God's particular call for these communities and in a lot of the members of, uh, a lot of the founders of these communities that we've talked about, right, they had very, um, you know, deep and meaningful relationships with God that informed, you know, how they founded the communities that they found in. Um, so a few, I guess, open-ended questions here at the end. Right. I've done this a few times throughout the course. 
Um, these aren't necessarily things that we've talked about, um, but I, I think it's a good thing to kind of sort of ask questions and, and get people thinking about, um, about these sorts of things, right? So, you know, how did the traditional vows, right? Poverty, chastity, and obedience, how did those shape monasticism? All right, and we've, we've talked about some of these things briefly before, kind of interspersed throughout here. Um, but, you know, without really having an answer, right, what, what would you say, I guess? Um, I'll open it up to the room. Well, it's either you or Andy. I know, that's I guess Lizzie. <laughs> our large room today. And I hope right. that let's watch this later. Um, <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, hmm. I think, you know, the easy one to identify is obedience, right? Like being obedient to a rule of life, obedient to the the, the life of the community and, and the way in which they live. Um, now I've seen poverty kind of work out differently depending on what community it is, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, some communities are ones in which people leave behind all of their old life in order to live into the community. And then others exist functioning um, very much still in the world where they do have jobs and have a house and... Um, right. And being chased is just being chased. Right. Well, you know, when you mentioned that with poverty, it reminds me of when we were talking about the Franciscans, right? And, you know, how even during Francis's lifetime, there was a debate internally within the community of, you know, sort of one side wanted to live this life of extreme poverty and be committed to that. And the other side recognized, well, wait, we have, you know, a real mission to the world. And there were Franciscans, you know, going along the Silk Road to China. There were Franciscans that were starting to go to the new world, right? There are Franciscans who were, you know, uh, in the Middle East, right? And, you know, working with, with pilgrims there. Um, so yeah, there's that sort of debate as to like, you know, even though these are the vows that we've made, how do we best live them out, right? And I don't think that there's one particular answer. Um, I think if there was one particular answer, there would be one monastic community, you know? <laughs> I feel bad calling on people, but I'm curious, Andy, if you have any thoughts here. <laughs> well, I think, you know, as I said, I was educated by Franciscans as well as Augustinians, Dominicans, but the biggest impact was the Franciscans, I think, later because it was the later, it was college rather than high school or elementary school. But um, I, I think in terms of the monasteries way back then, it was convenient for them to help the poor. They'd come together, they'd have farms, they'd have animals, they'd, have, they'd live a certain life and they share and provided things to, uh, to people. And uh, they had um, mutual support. I mean, they had their prayers together. They had... Um, uh, a spiritual direction by their head person typically, or maybe someone else. I mean, I I read and watch a lot of uh, English, uh, uh, I'm an Anglophile in that sense, some murder mysteries and, and other things often right. in, in, in these uh, communities. Uh, Oxford in particular, there's a whole bunch of uh, three different series of TV shows on public TV uh, uh, set in Oxford. Uh, so I think there was convenience in that sense, but you know, St. Francis showed the way uh, for them. And, you know, there was digressions here or there over the years, but I would think so. I remember clearly the Augustinian house that was across the street from the high school that had, I think, a couple dozen priests there. And one morning a week, it was a uh, turn for those of us in our class who went and would be uh, altar boys. And there would be literally a dozen altars in the basement and a dozen masses were going on yeah. at once because they had a requirement to, to say mass each particular day. Uh -huh. uh, so they, and then in the Franciscans in college, they, uh, even now, the, the spiritual director there is one of my classmates from 1970, Father uh, Bill Spencer is the uh, 
but he's a spiritual advisor for the students. You know, uh, I'm not sure right. the community or not. So I think it, you know, there are natural things for them to come together. I can't say that I have enough experience with any of these to, to really reflect um, uh, on, on what it meant to so many of them. Uh, I might have mentioned that my classmate in graduate school, he and I did our chemistry experiments together. He was a Roman Catholic priest, a divine word priest. And he's actually a missionary in Taiwan right now mm. and uh, continued his chemistry research, but also preaches. He's a Chicago boy like I am. And uh, he was part of the Newman community, uh, which, by the way, they don't use that term anymore. I think that's uh, frowned upon, as you may know. It's the CSA, Catholic Student Association. Uh -huh. I'm not sure why it's frowned upon, but they don't use it. I don't, they definitely don't use it. So I can't say I have much experience. I have a little bit of hint of the experience, but that's all. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I, I realize, too, that's one of those things that it's it's difficult to answer questions like this, um, not being a monastic, Right you know, um, or, or not having, you know, I mean, even Andy, like you said, right, you know, having education under these various orders, right, that's still a different thing than living it. Um, you know, um, I, I'm cognizant of the time here, too, I know, because there's the, the bishop, yeah, the, the bishops, yeah, right, so I don't, I think I'm going to actually skip through my second sort of open-ended question here, um, and just sort of really briefly here, and again, I know it's a small room here, so the feedback's going to be a little bit limited. Um, now that we've reached the end, you know, I, I'm just curious what your thoughts were, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you might want to have seen more of or less of, <laughs> um, you know, or anything that you might be interested in learning more about in the future so that I have a, you know, a topic for next time that I do something. <laughs> Well, I learned a lot more than I knew, even though I had connections with three of the orders that you're talking about. Uh, I really had uh, not much clue. Uh, and so uh, it was used to learn that. And then I studied, but I did read that large biography of Bonhoeffer. So I actually know more about him than uh, uh, the others. I you realize, by the way, he was engaged when he went into yes. prison. He never got to be married. He, his fiance was, and his family was able to visit him in prison, at least during part of the time. Um, right. And, and that did very much so if he wasn't engaged, she wouldn't have been able to visit him the way that she did. And, you know, we wouldn't have had some of the writings that he yes. wrote while he was in prison. So that was, mm -hmm. you know, at least for the scholarship, I suppose, a fortunate thing. But um, yeah, I, I definitely got that impression that a lot of folks, you know, didn't know a whole lot about you know, especially a lot of these early figures of monasticism. So I'm, I'm glad that you learned something. You were going to say something, Bridget, I'm sorry. No, oh, I'm, uh, <laughs> I love it. Lizzie says Oxford movement class next. <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't even, you didn't even mention Keeble. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, so Pusey, Keeble, and Newman are kind of mm -hmm. like the three names that bubble to the yep. top. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of like the Episcopal Church, like one of the things that I always want folks to understand is like when you look at our services of the daily office, morning prayer, evening prayer, complex, you know, how the monastic tradition and the cathedral tradition were woven together in mm -hmm. order for the prayer book to offer something for people to do at home. And so right. we owe a lot to the monastic tradition that that shapes our prayer life in the daily office today mm -hmm. whether we're monastic or not right uh, there's that connection that piece of of learning um you know and even being a priest and having gone to seminary and all the things like i for some reason did not remember pacomius so that was really interesting to like be like i totally mm -hmm. did not know that one um the mm -hmm. Oxford movement also meant that general seminary came under scrutiny just saying <laughs> so. yeah it's it's again i mean you know i know lizzie here saying you know do an oxford movement class and i'd be happy to but it's it is a very contentious issue and and even today right there's a lot of folks you know within the episcopal church within the anglican communion just broadly that you know it depends on which side of the Anglo-Catholic or, or whatever debate that you're on, um, 
And, you know, again, even for Catholics, right? Uh, Newman was canonized last year, right? Within the Catholic Church, you know? So how you view that sort of depends on a lot of different things. Um, but in any case. What, what about uh, Merton? You know, anything about Thomas Merton? I tried Seven Story Mountain and I couldn't get very far into it. I know a little bit about Merton. Um, I was considering including him um, in this class and just sort of for time constraint decided not mm -hmm. to. Um, I have one of the things that I was sort of looking at in, in building the class was the, uh, what is it, the silent life. Um, I had taken a look at that a little bit, but, you know, it's, um, I mean, again, you know, it's, it's an hour, <laughs> an hour each week, and it's what do I want to cover? Um, and I, he just didn't make the cut, but, but he was quite a fascinating individual. Well, um, uh, thanks for doing this, Kevin. I'm going to jump over to catch the presiding bishop. All so. right. Well, that sounds perfect. And I mean, just for the recording, I guess, thank you all again. Um, you know, I hope if you're catching this on YouTube that, you know, you go back to the very beginning and, and watch through it. Um, and, you know, for those of you who are here in person, again, thank you for taking your time on these Sunday afternoons for me. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs>